welcome to another episode of Trial Site News. California has quietly dropped the state's COVID-19 student mandates. The Los Angeles Times is suggesting that this is because COVID has evolved into a less deadly and more manageable and treatable stage. Now, this seems to be a topic worthy of delving into, and so we will. And so, from Trial Site News, I am Adrian, and our episode is starting right now. So, while California's government is celebrated by hardliners who believe in Orwellian control over the general population as the best way to combat COVID-19 as a pandemic, for many others, including a growing chorus of critics, are now suggesting that the various governmental and public units, from state offices to universities and school districts, went too far during the COVID-19 response. It is viewed as an overreach of constitutional norms, and so much more. Back in October of 2021, Gavin Newsom, who is the governor of the state of California, announced a universal COVID-19 vaccination policy. And this policy would eventually apply to 6.7 million public and private school children. The Golden State became one of the first states here in the U.S. where school districts proactively pushed universal COVID-19 mandates for children as soon as the Pfizer-BioNTech mRNA vaccine was formally approved. Now, however, with the science clearly pointing to the reality that the COVID-19 mRNA vaccines are not only non-sterilizing, but also lack breadth in response to various mutations and durability. The Los Angeles Times and other media reported that the state had quietly dropped the student COVID-19 vaccine mandate as the state emergency is planned to end on February 28th. And they aren't alone. The national public health emergency is also scheduled now to end by May 11th here in the U.S., now, apparently, the vaccine mandate in California for students was put on hold in April of 2022 by the governor, as was a bill that was designed to eliminate any exemptions for personal beliefs. This according to Howard Bloom for the Los Angeles Times. The mainstream media is now admitting that a confluence of forces converged to make such mandates not even practical anymore. Most notable is the fact that Bloom of the Los Angeles Times wrote that SARS-CoV-2, quote, has evolved to a less deadly, more manageable, and treatable stage. Although COVID-19 remains widespread and people continue to die from it, the availability of vaccines and antiviral treatments has lessened the effects, offering relief to what had been an overwhelmed public health system. The Los Angeles Times went on to add that the dramatic decline in deaths and hospitalizations over time gave Newsom confidence to schedule an end date for the state of emergency on February 28th, three years after he made the declaration. It is still taboo, it seems, for anyone in the mainstream media to express any critical views of the COVID-19 vaccine products. Oh no, can't have that, you see. The Los Angeles Times would go on to quote the California Department of Public Health, which said this, COVID-19 immunization is an important tool for keeping our kids healthy and schools open. Health officials strongly recommend immunization of students and staff against COVID-19 to prevent hospitalization and other serious complications, including death. Widespread vaccination has contributed to keeping California children in school to learn and to strengthen social connections. Turnkey mobile vaccination services remain available for any K-12 school within the state. Now, this announcement has been very welcome news to many concerned Californians. An example of this would be Jonathan Zacherson, elected to the Roseville City School District Board this past November. The Los Angeles Times would quote him, saying, This is long overdue. A lot of families have been stressed from this decision and worried about it for quite some time. I wish CDPH would make a bigger statement publicly, or Newsom would make a public statement, to let families know and school districts know that this is no longer going to be an issue for them. Now, the truth of the matter is this. Because the world found out very early on that the COVID vaccines were not preventing the contagion from spreading, despite early assurances that it would, a movement grew against inoculation mandates by the spring of 2021, which has only gained in momentum and strength as the fumbling leadership by every major government institution across the globe inspired something much less than confidence by their people. 
We have seen a growing chorus of critics pointing out that it didn't make much sense that if the products didn't halt the infection in the first place and thereby stop the transmission of the virus, what was the point of the mandates? There have been outcries from critics all over the globe who pointed to the shifting goalpost for the vaccine, which had evolved from ending the pandemic by brute force of vaccination to instead reducing the probability of serious infection, hospitalization, and even deaths. But there are two other elements that further weakened the prospect of these COVID-19 vaccine products as a permanent fixture on the vaccination schedule for everyone. First was their lack of breadth, in that as the SARS-CoV-2 virus mutated from Delta into Omicron and then various subvariants, and increasingly the pathogen evaded the vaccine's neutralizing impact, while also, and because of the mutating RNA virus, the durability of the vaccine was becoming more questionable. This was then why boosters were required, and since the release of the first COVID-19 vaccines to the market in mid-December of 2020, up to five doses have been administered, two in the primary series and up to three boosters including the most recent bivalent Omicron BA.4 and BA.5 booster doses. But the market resoundingly rejected this product despite intense and ongoing promotional edicts from the government echoed by health systems. As of the filming for this episode, only about 15% of all people eligible here in the U.S. for the booster shot have opted to take it. The whole strategy in response to COVID-19 should have been evaluated much more carefully. For example, early treatment, now emphasized once pharmaceutical products were approved, was de-emphasized in the early days of the pandemic when frontline providers produced various approaches in the clinics during the early stages of the pandemic. One such approach was the ICAM protocol, which was purportedly saving hundreds of lives out of one Florida-based health system. This involved the use of blood thinners and certain steroids, both later shown to help. We here at Trial Site News learned that once the CEO became aware of the protocol, it was cancelled. Sources conveyed that a contract between Pfizer and the health system precluded the latter from its employees developing any regimen for SARS-CoV-2, even though it was in the middle of a deadly pandemic. Assuming that these declarations are authentic, Pfizer leveraged its position in the pandemic quite ruthlessly to lock in behaviors it deemed appropriate. The message to health systems was clear. If you want access to the COVID-19 vaccines via clinical trials, sign this adhesion-style contract. Of course, there is also evidence that Pfizer enforced this approach not just here in the U.S., but worldwide via all sorts of unorthodox contracts with draconian clauses. In fact, we here at Trial Site News reported on this back in October of 2021. We wrote a story on an article titled simply Pfizer's Power from the nonprofit group Public Citizen, which took a well footnoted look at the relationship between Pfizer and national governments. The Public Citizen had located some unredacted Pfizer contracts that showed just how much power that firm wields. They reported at the time that Pfizer had the power to, quote, silence governments, throttle supply, shift risk, and maximize profits during the COVID-19 pandemic. As one government official had been quoted as saying, five years in the future when these confidentiality agreements are over, you will learn what really happened in these negotiations. Now back to California and the Los Angeles Times piece. Kevin Gordon, a lobbyist representing most of the state school districts, denied that there was any political pressure involved in this decision by the state. Instead, he said, and I'm quoting here, the public's appetite for these kinds of mandates is definitely not what it used to be. It makes no sense to now impose a heavy mandate when the amount of transmission is significantly lower than it was statewide. A one-size-fits-all solution doesn't work right now. And so it would seem that state agencies, school districts, and other units of government will likely back out of any hardline COVID-19 vaccine stances, for now anyway. This would include relevant mandates, as the science is irrefutably revealing the limitations of the current batch of COVID-19 vaccines. Although, given that we've seen the penchant for overreach and desire for dictatorial control over the citizens by the California state government, Something tells me that if given the opportunity, they would likely seize power all over again. Time, of course, will tell. And that, my friends, will bring our episode to a close once more. As always, thank you so much for joining me on the program today. For more content like this, be sure to check back to this channel daily, Monday through Friday. And for numerous written articles every day, check us out at trialsitenews.com. From Trial Site News, I am Adrian, and I will see you all 